This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to another episode of the Human Action Podcast, the show where we cover and read and review books in the hopes of encouraging you to read them, or at least take our Cliff Notes version of them so that you learn something. Uh, today, we are joined by a great friend of ours, Dr. Murray Sabrin. I'm sure many of you know his name. He was a longtime professor of economics up at Ramapo College in New Jersey. Uh, he ran for Senate up there and was supported, I suppose, by some of you in that effort. He's actually recently retired from Ramapo, uh, believe it or not. He's going to have a reading room named after him. And him and his wife have retired for the moment, although he's certainly not retired in terms of his work output. Uh, they have chosen a retirement home in an undisclosed location in Florida. How does that sound, Murray? Well, uh, since I'm not in the witness protection program, you could mention that we're in Fort Myers. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, you know, it's just fantastic to talk to you. Uh, you've got a new book out. It's on one of the most pressing subjects uh, of, of all, which is basically medical and health freedom, because we're seeing this medical fascism uh, under the guise of virus protection, which just happened er- earlier this week with the Biden announcement. So before we get into the book, uh, you know, just give me your immediate thoughts or takeaway from Biden's mandate announcements yesterday. What's so disconcerting, Jeff, especially for someone like me who's been around a long, long time, uh, having seen the, the doctor for the first time probably in the mid-1950s when uh, I came back from uh, summer vacation with a broken arm and uh, I had to go see the uh, our pediatrician about uh, getting be- better. But the point I want to make about this and is that no one, as far as I know, has hired Joe Biden to be their physician or Anthony Fauci to be their physician or Rochelle Walensky from the CDC to be their physician. The doctor-patient relationship is the key to optimal well-being and health. Unfortunately, we've seen the creep of medical statism, or as you call it, and I call it as well, medical fascism for the past 60 years, uh, since the introduction of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, which was one of the most uh, important dates in American history, July 30th, 1965, when uh, Johnson signed the two bills giving us uh, those two uh, mega programs for, uh, for medical care. And so the notion of mandates, medical mandates, is another example of trickle down economics. And this is a case trickle down medical care from the federal government. And I'm opposed to this with all my being because uh, I've always felt that health care, which is what we are responsible for as individuals, is our responsibility. And medical care is something we seek when we are not in optimal uh, health care. And we see a doctor or a specialist or uh, go see a, ho- see a hospital if we need to. But the point is the notion that the government's going to dictate what our medicine should be and what our protocol should be flies in the face of ethics, morality, economics, uh, common sense, judgment. And uh, I just listened to a little bit of Biden because I can't t- take too much of him. It, it was so over the top that um, good thing I'm, a, I'm not a violent person because um, I would have thrown something at the, at the computer watching his uh, presentation because I think what he did yesterday was throw down the gauntlet and it's going to be us state uh, g- governors and hopefully the Supreme Court that say, There is no constitutional basis for what Biden is advocating. And unfortunately, Jeff, and this is something that they're very slick in Washington about, instead of mandating vaccines for the whole country, they're getting companies to mandate vaccines for their employees. So that means 160 million Americans may have to be subject to the vaccine if medical fascism continues the way that Biden, I think, and his team wants, because they don't want to uh, create a hornet's nest by mandating this from Washington. So they're getting the uh, businesses to do their bidding. Well, so ladies and gentlemen, the book, the topic of today's show is called Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single Payer System by Dr. Sabrin. So Murray, the first thing I'm gonna ask you is we have universal medical care. I know you don't use health care. And the second thing, the case for a single payer system, of course, you mean something very different from what our progressive friends say, a single payer. So is the title designed to pull people in? Is it a bait and switch? Well, the reason I did it is because there are two single payers. One is what I grew up with, where my parents paid for the doctor in cash. The doctor doctor didn't have a, a huge staff in order to file all the insurance claims. 
And then when we got a prescription, we went to the local pharmacy and paid a few dollars for an antibiotic, which was or cough medicine back in the 1950s and 60s. So a single payer is something that I grew up with, where the, uh, the parents would be responsible for their children's well-being, take them to the doctor and pay for it. And so we've had a bait and switch, if you will, from the other side. They're saying that universal medical care has to be the government paying for medical care, which means the taxpayer paying for it through layers and layers of bureaucracy at the federal and state and local level. And so what I'm trying to do is get people to realize that we already had a single payer system for the most part until Medicare and Medicaid and in, in uh Employer-based insurance really took off in the 1970s with uh, HMOs and other um, programs that employers uh, did. But I think what we're seeing now is a very silent revolution in the um, in medical care. I just attended the uh, annual conference of the Free Market Medical Association, and there were doctors and other individuals there explaining how they're providing medical care through the free market. And that's, I think, what... I hope this book does is waking up people to the notion that we don't need Bernie Sanders prescription for medical care, for universal medical care, but I've laid out a blueprint for how we can do that in America. Well, Murray, I'm going to say, first of all, that those FMMA private doctors like Keith Smith are heroes and we ought to treat them as such, but I'm going to be willing to go out on a limb here and say, I bet the doctors you had as a kid in New York City in the 50s and 60s to which your dad simply paid cash when you went with your broken leg or whatever. I bet you they were excellent. I'm going to, I'm going to venture that they were excellent doctors. Well, here's the interesting thing about my doctor, my doctor, Dr. Zucker, whose name may ring a bell to you because his son is New York state health commissioner who advised Cuomo during this whole crisis. And I, I met uh, Howard Zucker back in the 1970s when he was a youngster in high school, very smart, uh, individual. He also has a law degree and he has six certifications in medicine. His brother, uh, who's two years older than he is, is head of heart transplants at Newark Beth Israel Hospital and has one of the greatest, uh, one of the best survival rates of heart transplant patients in the country. So these are two very smart individuals, uh, sons of my doctor, Dr. Saul Zucker, who was really a, an incredible human being. Not only was he an excellent pediatrician, but he's just a warm, compassionate uh, individual who was also an anesthesiologist. So he was in the operating room. So he saw a lot of what was going on in medicine. And um, he, he was my doctor. And then when we got married in 1968, Florence and I um, you, uh, he, he kept us on his patients because he really liked us and uh, we were his patients uh, well into our marriage. And then uh, he re basically retired from um, from practice in the 1980s. And he, he practiced medicine until he was 80 years old and then was a volunteer at the local hospital. And he was known as the baby doctor in the New York metropolitan region. And he was just an outstanding doctor. You don't find those doctors anymore because they're part of huge practices and they get to see you maybe 15 minutes. I remember visiting him um, back in the day, and he would spend a half hour, 40 minutes with you, explaining everything and going over uh, any condition that you may have and uh, what you should be doing about it. Those doctors are gone for the most part because of the corporatization of medical care, which is, I think, another unfortunate development in, uh, in America is that uh, doctors are no longer single practitioners or small group practitioners, they become part of this huge cog known as uh, corporate medicine. Well, and as your book points out in the first chapter, this all has its origins. In other words, the morphing of doctors like your childhood doctor to the big group practices we see today, this has its origins in the 1960s growth of the welfare state. So just help us understand that a little bit. Well, I think what happened, uh, as you know, Murray Rothbard wrote this great essay, um, The Origin of the Welfare State, which takes us back to the 1880s when those ideas were imported by American uh, students who uh, studied in Prussia, came back to the United States and said, hey, the welfare state is wonderful. We should have it here. And that took root in America. And it kept on evolving and evolving and evolving. And one of the interesting things that I came across, uh, which you may or may not know, because it's a very obscure development in the history of medical care, is that when Social Security was proposed during the Great Depression, a lot of uh, FDR's advisors wanted him to put in uh, some sort of Medicare program with Social Security bill and he said, no, it's it's too much at one time for the American people. And 30 years later, after uh, he signed Social Security in August of 1935, Johnson gave us Medicare, which Truman wanted right after World War II. 
And then, of course, we get employer-based uh, insurance because of wage price controls during World War II. Employers offered that benefit instead of raising wages, which they couldn't do. <clears throat> and so we were off to the races with government mandates, government involvement in Medicare and Medicaid. And instead of allowing the free market to flourish in medical care, the government has co-opted doctors. They've co-opted um, private contracting. They've co-opted uh, uh, the nonprofit sector to some degree. But the nonprofit sector in, in medical care is, is uh, increasing rapidly. I helped create one in Bergen County, the Bergen Volunteer Medical Initiative, based upon volunteers in medicine that started in the mid-90s in uh, Hilton Head, South Carolina. And they're flourishing across the country. I've uh, done a lot of research on, on how they function. People love the attention they get at the uh, volunteer medical centers because the doctors are not constrained by the insurance companies. They're not constrained by the government. It's totally a pure free market operation. And if Jeff, Jeff uh, Bezos and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett want to do something great for America, they would pour a few billion dollars in creating these nonprofit centers all across the country. And we could eliminate the $600 billion in Medicaid costs on the backs of the taxpayers. So that's one of the things I, I point out in the book is that we already have the infrastructure in place to transition from where we are, this hybrid system, to a, a single payer, nonprofit, for-profit, entrepreneurial medical care system where the consumer, the individual would be in charge rather than the insurance companies and the government. Well, when you say hybrid, of course you mean the introduction of large insurance companies. So we have health insurance. Of course, they are creations of the state in, in many ways. They're ostensibly private companies. But when you talk about the interference in the doctor-patient relationship, on, on my end, Murray is the patient. I don't really know much or even care much necessarily about the price of something, right? right. That's, that's the horrible distortion. So I'm not economizing my medical visits or, or decisions. But on the flip side, the doctor has somebody looking over his shoulder. Not only does he have to have a bunch of staff for billing, which you mentioned earlier, but someone might be looking over his shoulder and saying, no, 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 prescribe X drug instead of Y because it's cheaper. So the, the, it's not just the doctor – it's not just a patient-doctor relationship. You know, both of them are, in effect, uh, being given perverse incentives. Well, this is precisely why it, this is the great moral hazard we're facing. Patients have no idea what it's costing for their visit because they're just paying the copay. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a quick anecdote of one of the doctors I interviewed for the book on uh, direct primary care. And I know you've had people on your show talking about direct primary care. And at the uh, summit you had in New Hampshire, there was a discussion of that. So I interviewed a doctor right here in Fort Myers on direct primary care. And she told me of, of a patient who needed some sort of operation. I forgot it was a hip or whatever. And the local hospital quoted him a price of $20,000. He didn't have insurance. So she con she uh, got him to contact the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. And the operation, the transportation, the stay in Oklahoma was $5,000. More than a 75% discount from what the local hospital was paying. So this is another example of how hospitals have... have are creating a, a crisis in American medicine because their prices are out of line with what people can pay. So instead of having the, 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 the patient that determine the price through valuing with the service, you basically have a cost plus system in, in, in um, medicine and the insurance companies are picking up the cost. And, and of course, the ultimately it's, it's the taxpayer or the individual family that's paying it or the employer through premiums. And so it's a very perverse system. And if we had market-based pricing with transparency, which the Surgery Center of Oklahoma does on their website, then people can choose. And of course, the people on the left say, well, it's very tacky for doctors to advertise their prices and so on and so forth. But we do this all the time with every service that we want, whether it's a cell phone service or a cable TV service or clothing or, or other things, we are used to shopping around. In fact, I saw a statistic not too long ago, more people spend more time finding out the price of a, an appliance than they do finding out the price of, of medical care because th they're immune to what the price really is because of this current system. And I think we have an opportunity to point out people would be better off that have more money in their pocket, that have better quality healthcare as doctors compete for their for their business, 
so to speak. And uh, we would drive down prices probably 30, 40, 50, 70 percent as the surgery center of Oklahoma and other um, profit making entrepreneurial doctors have done throughout the country. But if a doctor is sitting there and he or she has an interest, at least in the back of their mind, other than the patient's direct best health care outcome, you know, whether they're worried about Medicare reimbursement or they're, or they're thinking about the third-party insurance company that's going to pay them, or they're worried about coding the visit, or they're worried about how many visits they have stacked up that day so they've only got a short amount of time with you. I mean, all of this creates a huge ethical conundrum for doctors themselves. There's no question about it. This is why the, the corporization of medical care in this country has been anti-patient. I mean, you see signs in hospitals that the patients come first, but uh, I can tell you from um, from what I've what I've heard about and uh, other stories that I've uh, uh, spoken to doctors about, the patients don't come first because if, if Medicare and Medicaid are paying the bills, then you have to make sure that you're uh, uh, complying with their rules and regulations, and the, and the patient uh, care comes secondary, if at all. And so we have a real, like you mentioned, a conundrum with, with what's going on in medical care. And I'm, what I'm hoping with this book is that it really wakens people up to the notion that they have to be in charge of their medical care. They should not be outsourcing their medical care to the Doc, to the to the hospitals, to to the uh, insurance companies, to um, to the government, and that's I think going to take to use a term from from uh, uh, far away. Uh, it's going to take a cultural revolution. But you first have to plant the seeds that what we have today is unsustainable. We know that Medicare is running out of money. That Medicaid is is causing lots of problems with patients trying to find doctors that will accept Medicaid patients. And doctors are getting burnt out. I think you're seeing retirees increase dramatically, especially during COVID. And so I think um, what we need to do is make the message loud and clear that people have to be in charge of their own well-being, their own medical decisions, and not the government. And I think Biden is helping people realize that they are overreaching their authority as, as a government entity to dictate to people what they should not be taking what they should be taking or not be taking into their bodies. And to me, this is what is uh, ne the next step would be, Jeff, is that if you are not vaccinated, you may not be able to fly, go on the airlines, uh, uh, go on um, the railroads, or, or do other things that makes life worth living. In other words, what we're seeing today is possible. The government total takeover of medical care and we do have the precedent for this in the United States, as we all know from World War II, we could have camps for the unvaccinated, just as we had camps for the Japanese during World War II. That to me, as the son of Holocaust survivors, really troubles me a lot. This notion that somehow you become an enemy of the state by not being vaccinated. And I think that's something that we have to stand up and say, people's medical decisions are their own with their doctor, not Fauci and Biden and company to tell us what medication we need in order to have optimal health. Well, I agree with every word. That's all very troubling. That's very scary. And I do think it's important to explain or to point out to people, as, as you say, the unsustainability of the current model and system. But it strikes me that there's another problem, a philosophical issue in the U.S. In the West, it's this idea that somehow, Murray, medical care is just different than other goods and services yeah. and that you have a right to it. So how do we change that mindset? Well, that's why the book's entitled From Conception to End of Life, because I have a proposal how every couple who is going to have a baby can make sure that baby is protected um, because there are, what, over 2 million births in the United States. So that would be a huge pool of money to, to help families who, have, who may have a child that may need specialized care because of some sort of genetic defect or some other situation. So that's why it, it's, a, it's an education uh, endeavor. I've been in education virtually all my adult life. The Mises Institute has been around for nearly 40 years, educating the public about various issues. So I think education is the key, as Ron Paul keeps on uh, mentioning it. Uh, the, the politicians, we know uh, they're not interested in, in 
truth. They're not interested in, in, in common sense. They're just interested in exercising power. So we have to go out to the masses. I think Rothbard was very clear on that. We have to have a grassroots sort of populist movement on this very key issue, which is if the government takes over medical care, lock, stock, and barrel, Jeff, then it means that we are no longer a free people because the government can dictate how we live, what we ingest, uh, and every other aspect of living, they will control from, from literally birth to end of life. And so what I'm suggesting with the book is that there's a better way to achieve the goals that the progressives say they want to, which is universal coverage. And we can do it without this massive tax system that we have today and use cash, which is what we used historically to pay for things that we want. And the, the notion that medicine is a somehow different than cable service or anything else that we purchase or cell phone service is, I think, um, is really misplaced because people have to be in charge of their decisions regarding everything about living as a human being. And learning about your own body, which you should be doing as a youngster, your parents should be should be teaching you about what, what it means to have uh, optimal health with proper nutrition, exercise, fresh air, all the things that grandma talked talk to us about. Unfortunately, I never had any grandma because they were all killed during World War II. But the point is, your parents always told you, get some exercise, uh, get some fresh air, and eat properly. So this is nothing new. It's it's part of our uh, humanity, if you will, or, or the human experience of what works in order to achieve optimal health. Well, so if, if we're looking to change the model, and we know the costs are unsustainable, it, it has to start uh, on some level with the individual. And you have this chapter in your book about wellness and optimal health and personal responsibility. So first and foremost, we, in other words, it's incumbent on us to start taking a little bit of responsibility for our health care and not just, you know, every little sniff will go in and expect a pill. Right. Right. This is why when I interviewed Dr. Glenn Jarrow, who's a wonderful naturopath in New Jersey, I've known him for over 30 years. He's a libertarian oriented and he does a cash business. He doesn't accept insurance and he has a thriving practice because he understands what people's needs are from a health perspective. And he works with them and he works with doctors, by the way. He, he told me he had doctors shadowing him in his office to learn what he's doing in order to get people to optimal health. And so this is the integration of uh, traditional medicine and um, naturopathic medicine to really help people achieve that wellness, whether it's a heart problem, cancer, or other illnesses that he works with. And we know Jeff, what's happened the past 18 months because of COVID is mental health problems have gone through the roof. We've seen increase mm. in suicides. We've seen increase in alcoholism, increase in drug abuse. And so here, here's another example of the unintended consequences of these government lockdowns, which were so over the top. I just found them just so appalling that we would lock down the whole country because for a few weeks, for a few months, because people were getting sick and going into hospitals. I mean, we've had bad flu epidemics in the past where we didn't close anything down. We didn't wear masks. We didn't social distance. We just accepted it as a normal course of, uh, of the flu season. But this is something different. There's something going on here. And you know that people have been writing about this for quite a while, that this is an example of the Great Reset and what this means for the transformation of the global economy into a collectivist uh, statist model uh, based in either Geneva or wherever they're going to base it in or the United Nations, whatever. And so this is what we have to stand up and fight for. I mean, when I became a libertarian in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, I saw the hope that we would not go into this abyss. But unfortunately, we're here. And now we have to fight like hell in order to get us out of it. Well, you mentioned Keith Smith's medical clinic and the, the fact that they have prices listed in a menu form for various surgeries, all inclusive, I might add, anesthesia, travel, hotel, et cetera. So I want to talk about basically the three pillars. You and I would agree, given our understanding of economics, that you know that we know what the perfect system is. The perfect system is cash for basic services, like your dad paid when you were a boy, high deductible, catastrophic insurance for you know, getting, getting in a car wreck or getting, you know, a, a cancer diagnosis, but it's got to be priced according to actuarial reality, right. which means your lifestyle habits and your age and your weight and those kind of things come in. That's just the, that's just the breaks. And number three, an overlay of charitable 
hospitals and clinics for the truly poor and indigent. So that's basically the model that we had in the United States for maybe the first half of the 20th century. And, and that actually worked. If we could have that model with today's technology and medical advancements, Murray, we'd be in good shape. It's happening. Uh, there, there are these um, organizations uh, like Forward based in, in San Francisco. I keep on getting their uh, emails and they do something. I think, I don't know, I think it's a hundred dollars a month for comprehensive medical care. And it's state of the art uh, uh, facilities that they have where they do incredible uh, testing to make sure that you're at optimal health. If we can prevent people from having heart disease and uh, catching cancers early and uh, making sure that diabetes is under control, we, we would lower our medical care costs from the nearly $4 trillion it'll be this year, because the last time I looked at the data was $3.8 trillion, and that was a couple of years ago, so it's probably $4 trillion a year, 20% of the U.S. economy, when at one time it was well under 10%. So medical care costs have gone through the roof. And the question is, and the irony is that people are not getting any healthier. If you look at the uh, uh, data, uh, the obesity numbers in this country are 40%. And uh, by 2030, which is not that far away, it's going to be over 50%. Then we know that obesity is related to a whole host of chronic illnesses. And there's another aspect of obesity, which uh, is nowhere discussed in, in, in the media, is I think three quarters of the people who have died from COVID have been obese. And uh, that's a shocking statistic. So you would think that the CDC and Fauci would talk about how lifestyle uh, is affecting people's contraction of COVID. And that we, what we need to have is a national discussion about what, what, what it means to be uh, to have optimal health instead of uh, inoculating everybody with this experimental um, medication. Well, you know what I what bothers me so much about the current system, we saw this yesterday with Biden, is that when you start getting everyone paying into something, when you start to get this mentality among taxpayers that, hey, I'm paying for your health insurance. You know, if you if you get in a motorcycle crash without a helmet and you end up in the hospital, I'm going to end up paying for that either directly through my taxes if you're uninsured or through higher premiums. Uh, if you are insured. So the, the more government's gotten involved over the years and, the, and it's their proxies, which we think of as nominally private health insurance companies, which I think is a misnomer, the more they've gotten involved, the, you know, the more government can turn around in a vicious cycle and say, well, because everyone's paying, you know, it's not just about you, Murray, if you decide to smoke. It's not just about you, Murray, yeah. if you decide to not get a vaccine. Well, this is why personal responsibility is so critical to not only medical care, but everything else, whether it's education, whether it's housing, whether it's transportation, is the notion that somehow uh, collectively we can use coercion at the federal, state, and local level to achieve good outcomes, I think is a, one of the great myths of society, is that freedom is the essence of the human experience. And unfortunately, government has interfered with people's ability to make decisions for themselves and be accountable for those decisions. That's what it comes down to. Uh, there's a great quote. I've never forgotten this quote from the mid 1970s. It's a quiz that should be given. Who said people smoke too much, they eat too much, they drink too much, then they want to, uh, me for, to pay for their health care. That was Governor Jerry Brown when he was running for president in 1976. And so he made sort of a libertarianish argument that individual responsibility is important in order to be to avoid being a burden on your neighbor. And no one talks about that. When you when the government pays for you, it has to tax somebody in order to pay for your benefits. That means you're being a burden on your neighbor. So how is that compassionate? And so, again, we go back to this whole concept of personal responsibility and accountability. And the last thing government wants is to make people have people become financially independent. Then they don't need government. And so another concept of the book is financial independence and personal responsibility go hand in hand, because that's what I learned as a youngster, seeing my father go to work, bring home a paycheck, pay for the bills. And uh, we, we lived happily ever after. And so we didn't, we were in a low middle income uh, uh, income situation. My father was making three, four dollars an hour as a sheet metal worker back in the 1950s and early 60s. And uh, we were able to live fairly well, given the technology of the time, having TVs, a record player and so on and so forth, going to the Catskills for the summer, which was uh, a great uh, luxury for us. But it was my parents figured it was a worthwhile thing for the family to do. So today, people need to take 
stock of where they are in life instead of outsourcing their lives to the government. And that's exactly what's happened, uh, Jeff. People have outsourced their lives, whether it's education, whether it's housing, whether it's medical care, and a whole host of other things. So rather than being a free and independent individual and having sovereignty of their own life, people have said, hey, I can't deal with all these things that I have to uh, make decisions about. So I want the government to do that for me. Yeah, isn't that interesting? No, you talk about outsourcing. I mean, what about outsourcing of the, there's an entitlement to it? I mean, relative to today's material standards, uh, you know, I'm sure when you were a kid in your household, your your dad's modest income, I mean, you were economizing as a way of life. Absolutely. I mean, this was just day in, day out, and you didn't feel oppressed or constrained. You, do, you weren't feeling sorry for yourselves. I'm sure you didn't view yourselves as impoverished. That's just mm-hmm. the way it was. And so- I think today we just have this mentality, which is so pervasive, that that somebody needs to give me this. This, I think, is the greatest tra- – one of the greatest tragedies in American society is that culturally we've gone from this free and independent outlook on life to where people feel that they're entitled to a whole host of things. And you see this even among uh, – well-educated upper middle income suburbanites, even wealthy people, look at Warren Buffett, thinks that we should have a a welfare state and others like that. And uh, in my book, I quote Peter Drucker, who who wrote probably one of the most libertarian-ish articles for the Wall Street Journal exactly 30 years ago, December 1991, where uh, it profits us to uh, strengthen nonprofits, where he demolishes the welfare state in in a couple thousand words. It it is something that every libertarian and every American should read because he points out the welfare bureaucracies don't achieve their objectives, but the nonprofit sector does because people have to voluntarily give money to a nonprofit and buy into their mission in order for, for that nonprofit to achieve wonderful things in their community. And that's exactly what Volunteers of Medicine does throughout the country. Well, the final chapter of your book is sort of the summation toward the individual single payer medical care system. You know, let's say tomorrow, Murray Sabrin, Dr. Murray Sabrin is installed as, as health czar with unlimited powers. What, what would your optimal world look like? Just, just summarize it for us. Well, basically, uh, we would try to create as many nonprofit health centers across the country to eliminate the $600 billion Medicaid bill. Then we would transition all the wealthy people that are on Medicare, like um, like Warren Buffett and the Clintons and anyone who's who believes in the welfare state, say, you're on your own now. You have enough income to pay for your own medical care, uh, medical bills. And then we would uh, create... Uh, super health savings accounts for working people so they can put money in tax-free, have it grow tax-free and take it out tax-free. And so the government would quickly get out of the uh, Medicare business as as quickly as possible. And then doctors would be uh, uh, freed from the burden of insurance uh, paperwork and Medicare and Medicaid and have them do direct primary care and give an incentive for medical students to become uh, uh, general practitioners. And so we could, we could do a tax moratorium for, doctor, for medical students that want to uh, be uh, GPs. And uh, we could do a, a, a moratorium, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, it doesn't matter. Since I wrote the book, Tax-Free 2000 in the 1990s, Jeff, this could be the beginning of creating a tax-free society as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the book is called Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single-Payer System. You can find it on Amazon. You can download it on your Kindle. It's a great book, easy read, very free of jargon, uh, concise, clear arguments, concise, clear chapters, and I really think devastating. I mean, you can't ignore the economics of healthcare any more than you can ignore gravity when you're out, uh, you know, uh, d- driving your car. So, Murray, I want to thank you for writing this book. I think it's an important book. Uh, we will link to it in the show notes. We'll also link to our our Health Freedom Summit, which we held earlier this year up in New Hampshire, because that was really an incredible day and included, among other guests, Dr. Keith Smith, who was mentioned earlier in the show. So I think there's a revolution brewing here, and I think it, it may be, Murray, because of necessity rather than ideology, but it's I think there may be exciting times ahead. And so I, I really commend you for writing a positive book that uh, shows us some daylight. Well, thank you, Jeff. And as I mentioned to you, uh, the royalties from this book will be going to support organizations like the Mises Institute and others, the nonprofit health center. So I urge everyone listening to get a copy of the book, uh, especially the Kindle edition, and uh, give it as a gift. Uh, the holidays are coming up in December. Give, give as many gifts as possible because uh, 
I've committed myself to, to writing in retirement and using the uh, the royalties to create as much free markets in America as possible. And, and we desperately need free markets in medical care. Well, if we think about it, your dad was a sheet metal worker, and that enabled you to go on to college and work in an intellectual setting as an economics professor. And in, in that sense, have a, a better uh, and more prosperous life than he did. And, that, and that's, Murray, I think what you and I owe to future generations to try to do the same. Well, that's it. I mean, uh, as we know, life is short. And um, uh, as, as I said, uh, in retirement, I'm going to be working uh, harder than I did when I was working in order to uh, create the type of society we can leave to future generations. And they'll thank us immensely for getting rid of the statism that is now galloping. It used to be creeping. Now it's galloping because of COVID and Biden's mandates. And so uh, I've, I've rolled up my sleeves. I've got another book coming out next month. I'm writing another book on medical um, insurance and the workplace uh, that's due next year. So I'm doing my part to educate as many Americans as possible to make sure that uh, we do create a society or do go back to a society where the individual is sovereign, where we have voluntary relations, we have charitable institutions that take care of the people around us who need help, and that we can survive and thrive in a, in a society that is at peace with the rest of the world. And that's the um, libertarianism that I embraced uh, nearly 50 years ago. And hopefully there are many more years I can work toward that goal. And so uh, I thank you and thank the Mises Institute for making my classes uh, much more um, instructive for my students with all the material that you post there because uh, my financial history class has been one of the uh, crowning achievements of my teaching career and the students loved the material that they got from the Mises Institute that, uh, I, that were part of the uh, syllabus for several years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Murray Sabre, thank you so much for your time and have a great weekend. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.